Right. So now we have done with uh, review of our uh, microeconomics. So in this chapter, we're going to start to give you an introduction of macro. Okay. So in some sense, so this this chapter is going to be a little bit shallow. It is shallow in the sense so we are going to go deep after after this one. All right. So what are we going to do in this chap in this chapter? So we are going to do the following. So this is a roadmap. So we're going to explain the difference between micro and macroeconomics, right? And then so we're going to study what is this cycle. Essentially, it's a fluctuation. And this is going to, this is going to compare with long run economic growth, right? So this is cycle or short-term economic fluctuation and long run economic growth. Those are the two main issues in macroeconomics. And after that, so I'm going to explain to you the inflation and deflation. And finally, we are going to look at the some like open economy, macroeconomic issue, like uh, trade deficit, and trade, uh, trade surplus, right? So that's a roadmap. Now let's start with this exercise. So what would you be your guess regarding the current annual inflation rate? And similarly, so what would be your guess of the current uninformed rate? What would be your guess before you look at those the actual number. What do you feel? What do you heard? What do you, what's your conjecture? Inflation rate. 13% of for inflation, a little bit high, but it's very cold. But depending on what, what you look at, what, what do you heard about the unemployment rate? Wait, so now I'm asking you unemployment rate. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit different, but they are connected. Yes. Like 6%, 5%. So that's very close. Uh, so if you're interested in just can click, in, uh, click there. So there are two things. Number one, so inflation and unemployment, that's what we care as a matter of economy. And then number two, this number are uh, closely connected. And later you're going to see they have very interesting correlation. Actually, there are three points. And the number three, so this answer the number now. For inflation rate for the US, right now it's very high. It's very, very high. Okay. So like a 10%. Now it's like a slightly uh, decline. But right now still it's very high. Actually, this it has lots of implications on the stock market. For the unemployment rate, it's very low, very, very low, like 4%. But usually in general, so Nebraska, for some reason, so the state of Nebraska, the unemployment rate is lower compared to national average and compared to other states, right? Okay, so those are just two slides to show you what we care as a macroeconomics, uh, as a macroeconomy, right? So now I'm going to, before I show you the difference between micro and macro, let me give you a quick introduction regarding to the origin of macroeconomics. So macroeconomics did not exist before the Great Depression. Right, so actually, so it it came out just around the time of Great Depression, which is 1930. Right, uh, as a matter of fact, during the Great Depression, President Hoover, so his policy failure largely coming from our misunderstanding or our ignorance regarding to how macroeconomic works. Right, back then, so the conventional wisdom is largely coming from the standard or classical microeconomics like we just reviewed. And to summarize there, usually we believe there's an invisible head. And there we believe the market economy is going to correct its own mistake. There we believe the market is going to eventually reach equilibrium. And finally, the implication regarding to the Great Depression or what they understood back then is, okay, we just leave the economy alone. Let's just be patient. Let's just be calm. And then eventually, all things are going to sort out. Right, so that's that was the conventional wisdom, but this conventional wisdom was a big misunderstanding, was a big mistake, actually to make the things worse. Right, and here, here it just kind of two pictures shows. So what happens? What happens? Or what what people believe back in 1930? So this is I believe this is 1932 uh, general election. Right, so on the right hand side you can see. So there are two uh, presidential uh, Kennedy, right? So there are two uh, um, two parties, like two 
presidential uh, uh, candidates, so they are competing for White House. On the Lebanon side is uh, is a uh, president uh, Hoover. He was uh, incumbent president, right? Look at what it was his uh, uh, election slogan. He said, "So look at there, be patient and calm. No one can catch a fish with anger, right?" So essentially, what he was trying to say is like what just, what is like what I just explained to you. So they use the conventional wisdom. They believe. Our economy has the ability to correct its own problem. Okay. And then just be calm and be patient. And eventually we will sort out everything. So that was what he believed. On the right hand side, you can see so FDR, he has a different uh, view. And uh, he said, okay, so happy days here again. But then, so how he can promise happy days? And then what we can bring happy days back, right? And then, so that just means that the government needs to do something, right? But remember back then, back then, so people don't have a clear, clear clue how the macro economy works. And usually they believe we shouldn't let the government step in, right? So, but that's, the, that's kind of a watershed moment. And people realize, so the trouble, when the, when the economy is in the trouble, the government can do something, can help us, can bring back the prosperity, can bring the economy back on track. Okay, on the left hand side, so Hoover believes, so we just be patient, we just let the economy to sort out itself. So that's the difference. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, Hoover taught the mistake, uh, terms in the, the term, right, so it's called Hoover real, which was used to, to describe the poverty. You, we observe throughout the United States, okay? But you may wonder, so what kind of policy mistake he made? In today, so like even, even now, we just start to study macroeconomics. You probably already knew. So when the economy has a big trouble, what do you think the government should do? Or what do you have observed what, what the government did? So for example, 2020, what the government did? Huh? Intervene, like how? Like more, uh, budget companies. Right, spend a lot, right? Okay, so to, to, to summarize, the government intervened and they spent a lot. But back in 1929 or 1930, so President Hoover, his policy is we are going to stay away. We are going to hands off. We, so even worse, even worse, not only so they just don't spend more, actually they cut spending. Okay, so the reason why they call spending is because so they are trying to balance the budget. Okay, but then so think about for the government. So what's the government's budget? On the left hand side, you have income. Where the income coming from for government? From taxes. On the right hand side, is government spending, right? And then during the recession, what do you think about the tax? Is going to increase or decline? I mean, the tax revenue. What do you think? It's because why? That's a good point. Right, so basically, so the tax for income is going to shrink, right? So it's declining, and then in order to keep the balance, what they need to do in terms of spending. You have lower income as a government. Okay, in order to balance the, balance the budget, what do you need to do? You need to, decline, you need to decrease your spending, right? But this is exactly opposite what, uh, exactly opposite to what the modern government is going to do, right? But that is trying to explain. So what was his mistake? But we cannot blame him too much because again, as I just mentioned, so modern macroeconomics do not exist at that point. But now we understand what's going on, right? Okay. Now let's see. So what is the difference between micro and macro? Okay. So there are a bunch of questions. Let's just pick two as example. Okay. On the left hand side is a typical micro question. Okay. Example could be should I go to business school or take a job right now? This, this typical question we ask by a um, graduate. Uh, as, uh, sorry, this is a typical question maybe asked by a college graduate. Right? So, what is, but then, so to answer, to answer that question, usually you're doing some like trade off analysis. You are going to see in the margin, right? In the margin, so what is the cost and what's the benefit? 
On the right hand side, the macroeconomy is going to ask a different question. Let me ask how many people are employed in the economy. Right? This is not about individual. This is about the aggregate. This is about this is about the macroeconomy. Right. So now in the bottom, so we have another example. What determines whether Citibank opens a new office in Shanghai or in Omaha? Right? Again, so they see in the margin. So now on the right hand side, so the question would be what determines overall trade in goods, service, and the financial sector between the United States and the rest of the world. So you can see we are looking at much larger scale. But for the moment, you are tempted to see, even that on the right hand side is a simple summation of the things happen in the left hand side. So this is the temptation, right? But as a matter of fact, macroeconomics this is not a simple summation of microeconomics. And this is a famous example. This example is called paradox of thrifty. How do I understand that? Just imagine the economy is in a recession. Right, right now, I guess, so many people would worry about recession coming, right? So now let's say, for example, if you worry about recession as a as an ordinary person, what is your fear? Why you worry about recession? What that matters to you? What do you think? I'm sorry. Uh, that's usually that's not the way. Okay, uh, that's a little bit too complex. Just think about it in terms of jobs. Like how that matters to you. They're going to be less jobs. So. They're going to be less jobs, jobs, and then so you have a high chance to lose your job, right? Or you may uh, have a hard time to find a job. Okay, so that's why people fear about recession. Okay, so now. If you have such concern, what are you going to do with your spending? If you worry about so the recession comes, I may lose my job, or I get laid off. So what are you going to do with your with your spending? You're going to save more money, right? So this is very rational. This is optimal from my point of view, right? Okay, very good. But now if everyone do the same things. If everyone, sorry, I should say, if everyone does the same thing, what that means in the aggregate level? So in aggregate aggregate level, what's going to happen is so the total expenditure is going to decrease. Now, if total expenditure decrease, what that means to GDP? What does it mean to GDP? I guess here, so we probably need to. I need to remind you a question we studied earlier. So we have seen the equation y equal to c plus i plus g plus nx, right? So we say, okay, so you will worry about recession. And then everyone is going to decrease the consumption, right? And then if everyone decreases consumption in the aggregate level, remember this equation is an aggregate level. If everyone reduces consumption because out of the cautions of the recession, okay, and then so in the aggregate level, this C is going to decline. If C is going to decline, what this means? This just means the GDP is going to decline. Right? Now what happens? What happens is so when we start the discussion, or when I mention so your fear about a recession, the recession is only a possibility, right? Now, so you start to worry, and yes, on the individual level, your decision is optimal because you're trying to save, you're saving for the rainy day, right? But now collectively, you make this possibility become the reality. Is that clear? So you can see, okay, so in the micro level, your decision is optimal, is rational. You save for uncertainty. But then, so collectively, we convert this possibility into reality. Okay, so you can see, so in that sense, macro is not a simple summation of microeconomics because we are connected. And each of us, if we collectively do something, in the aggregate level, you're going to see something unexpected. Okay. 
All right, to summarize, the well, modern macroeconomics largely was established in 1930, or we just learned from, from, the, uh, from the Great Depression, right? Before 1930, the conventional wisdom is that, so the economy has the ability to self-regulate itself, or usually we believe there's a market economy, we believe the invisible hands that can, that can navigate us toward the equilibrium, right? So it's kind of summarized by President uh, Hoover said, so be calm, okay? Be patient. Just wait the economy to sort out everything. That was the conventional wisdom before 1930. After 1930, now we have Keynesian economics. Oh, by the way, Keynesian is uh, he's considered the founding father of modern macroeconomics. He studied the uh, Great Depression and or he observed what happened during Great Depression. And he uh, invent or he discovered the secret or how the macro economy work. And he has thought about what we can do uh, or what the government should do, right? And basically, so he believe, he believe there are two things. Number one, he believed most of the economic trouble was caused by demand side, number one. The number two, so whenever there's economic trouble, the government should step in trying to lift up spending, right? So this is this is Robert, this is it. this is idea. Right. Now, this graph is kind of tell you tell you what happened during the past century. Okay, uh, how we, how we read this? Uh, this graph we have recorded most of the recession, I think, or a recession. Let's say again, we do look at 1929, okay? And then so here, what do we do? We just trace the percentage of a job loss, okay? Since onset or since the beginning of each recession. So this says when the, when the recession starts in 1929, you can see there are more and more people lost their job. In the worst day, look at it here. This is after three years, all right? Just build you, okay? Because this is like a month, 41 months. This is roughly like 45 months, almost four years. After four years, so you can see more than 30% people lost their job. And this process was very lengthy. Look, so it took, uh, this is took it took more than it took more than ten years. You see that because this is after almost one hundred fifty months, and finally, finally, so we return to this level. Is that clear? Okay. So what do we learn from here? It just says yes. Actually, so during nineteen twenty nine Great Depression. For most part, for most part, we leave the economy alone. Okay, remember this. This was before the before the invention or before the uh, birth of, of modern macroeconomics. We largely choose a uh, stand, uh, hands off approach in terms of uh, macroeconomic policy making. But now, so yes, eventually the economy returns to normal or to pre-recession level. But you can see this is, is a lengthy process. Not only is it take a while, it take more than 10 years, and also the cost is very high in terms of a job loss, all right? So now we can compare the rest, right? So like, so it's, this is like a 1960, 1948, 1970, 2001, 1990, 1980, so on and so forth. There are many, right? So if we compare the rest of the recession to Great Depression, okay, immediately you can see so most of the other recession compared to this one is much shallower. Okay, when we say shallow, it just means so the slump. It's not as dramatic as this one, right? Okay, 
But then, so you may wonder, so what is behind the difference or why the rest of the recession is shallower compared to 1929? But there certainly, it could be the shock itself is less severe. So say, for example, there is a winter storm, right? Not all winter storm the same, or not all winter storm alike, right? So certainly, the natural of the shock or the natural of the recession is different. But on top of that, the policy response is also very different. To convince you, to convince you, look at 2020. Right? So now everyone understands what happened. Okay. So you can see, first of all, if you look at the first few months, actually the first first month. You can see, so this recession comes in a much larger scale compared to Great Depression, right? But fortunately, we have we have better economic understanding of how macroeconomy works, and the government becomes more determined, right? And then, so their action was more swiftly and more resolute. And you can see, so the economy rebound very quickly. Okay, I don't have better data, but so we can imagine because like it's it us. I was asking one or two students, right? So everyone knew so the the unemployment rate right now is fairly low. Right? So this is like a common set or this kind of everyone knew. But it means yeah, so if we if we have a picture, it's probably something like this. Okay, let me just erase everything to make sure we understand. So what I'm saying is, if we have better data, it's probably most likely this, like here. Now, if you compare this one with this one, okay? So this one in terms of magnitude is comparable with pressure pressure. I mean, in terms of natural, the shock itself, right? And then if we compare this two, the only difference is what, or the largely the difference coming from what? Coming from government response. In, 20, in 1929, there wasn't much response, except after FDR was elected. And then we have the credit deal. How many of you heard about credit deal? A little bit, so can you tell us what's about credit deal? It, do, you, do you know anything? I heard of it, I'm, my brain is like you. Okay, so, so in the very crude way, the great deal of what they are trying to do is in the very crude way, sometimes you probably heard from other clubs, in a very crude way, government spend. And then, so the government spend is going to create a job. And sometimes, sometimes people use the following as an example. So basically, so the way to spend it is they're going to dig a hole on, uh, on Dodge and then hire someone to fix the hole and then immediately create jobs. But in, but in reality, it's slightly different, right? Great deal. So what they did is, so they are renovating the highway system. And many like a national project, uh, the one example, one good example is a Hoover Dam. A little bit ironic, because uh, Hoover didn't do anything, right? So because that's what he believed. But then so FDR, so think, so we need to sit in, we need to invent, we need to spend, we need to leap up the spending to help the economy, right? And then so, Part of the great deal is just build up this huge dam. So I don't know how many of you have been to a Hoover Dam, but you heard about Hoover Dam, right? Okay, so it was very impressive, right? And then spent a lot of money to build up this Hoover Dam, right? So these things immediately create a job. Can you understand that? Right? Because they didn't hire someone to build this huge dam, right? But this dam itself has tremendous impact. This is infrastructure is going to help. The region, right? So they generate the electricity, right? Is that clear? Okay. But anyway, so the, the end goal of this class is trying to understand what's the rationale behind the government spending, or maybe put a different effect. What is the, what explains the difference between here versus here? But we can see the difference, right? Are you with me? Okay. Now I'm going to quote a sentence. This is a famous one by John Mary King. 
Again, it means considered fun in order of macroeconomics. We probably have seen this before. So the key word here, he said, is low. He said, in the long run, we are all dead. Yes, if you take this literally, yes, we are going to die, right? So today, so the other day I was reading a newspaper, it says, says you know, your generation, you have most of us in this classroom, you have 10% of chance to, to, uh, to uh, live for 100 years old. But there's a physical thing, right? So in the long run, we're all dead. But the literally, what you are trying to say is the following. Let's just go back to the previous slide. Literally, what he was trying to say is the following. So eventually, so we will come back here. Okay, eventually. But, but, so during this process, many people are gonna die. Many people are gonna suffer, right? And then it's better to do something. That's, that's what he meant in that sentence. Right. Now let's just look at the second topic, right? Business cycle. What is business cycle? Essentially, it's a fluctuation of our economy, right? Let's just go back here. Okay. So here, in this in this slide, I show you the most major recession. Okay. So what is recession? Essentially, is the economy is in the downturn. But what does that mean? Usually means uh, output decline, unemployment increase. But in other words, the economy is in a hard time, right? And then since 1930, most, I would say, like all the government trying to do something to help the economy. But the way they do, or way they help, or way to improve the economy is different. Or in other words, they are going to use different tools Okay, they are use different tools, right? So usually they are going to restore one or the other. On the one hand, they can use monetary policy. Okay, what is monetary policy? Essentially, they are trying to change the quality of money supply. But these days, usually they focus on interest rate. Okay, back in 70 and 80, they focus on money supply. But you may wonder what's money supply. So we are going to have one chapter to discuss what is money supply, right? But usually now they focus on interest rate, right? So you may wonder how interest matter, how interest rate matter to me. What do you think? In what extent the interest rate matter to you? You have a credit card. Do you take a loan to buy a car? You do. Uh, no? Well, right. So, okay. So, the interest rate high, and then so your incentive to borrow or use incentive to purchase, to consume using borrowed money is going to lower. Right? If that's the case, and then in aggregate, the demand is going to lower. So, in that sense, interest rate matters. Interest rate is the key instrument by central bank to regulate the economy, okay? Alternatively, they may use physical policy. What is physical policy? So usually they are going to focus on changing tax or changing transfer. What is tax? Like now we are approaching the tax season, right? Do you need to file a tax return? You, you file yourself or you know, somebody else help you? I guess. You do it yourself. So you, you understand so how tax affects your spending, right? So for example, if they cut a tax, you have extra money to spend. Very good. So now what is transfer? Do you have any idea what's that? Like a tax return? Uh not 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 exactly. So to be precise, transfer is some money even to you. Tax return is is that is a different, right? So they can withheld your tax and then return to you. When I say transfer, it's like, say, for example, in a tax return, there's something called like, a, like credit or 2020. I think most of us receive a check. Did you receive a check from the government? But your parents receive. Is that right? Okay. So that's considered transfer. 
Okay. But then, then clearly, so this transfer has impact on most of us, right? Maybe the magnitude is different, right? So, but usually, so you're going to spend a fraction. Does it make sense? Okay. So anyway, so here, so I, we cannot go in, in depth, but this is something we are going to discuss in detail later, right? So the government has different tools, either through monetary policy, usually focus on interest rate, or fiscal policy, usually focus on tax or transfer. But regardless of what they use, their goal is the same. They are trying to affect overall spending. You may wonder why they focus on overall spending. So this is because, this is because I need to write this equation again. So this is because y equal to c plus i plus g plus nx, okay? And remember why we can interpret y through different aspects, right? Like income, product, or expenditure. Okay, so this first reason we look at C because C is one of the component number one. Okay, this spending, even why is overall spending number one. Number two, number two, as I mentioned in a few slides earlier, actually, we are going to see that again. Okay, so most of the time, our economic trouble was caused by demand side shock. Okay, so that's why, that's the main reason why usually government policy focus on overall spending. Because overall spending is a demand side. If the trouble coming from demand side, and then you should focus on demand side. All right. But certainly there are other thoughts or other views regarding to the macroeconomy. But now the main thing economists believe most of the time the young trouble was caused by weak demand. And then you, know, you, you want you do want to improve the economy, you should focus on demand. So that's a logic. Right? Okay, so let's just quickly run through a few uh pictures. So all those was uh, taken in the United States, that is during the time of the Great Depression. Here just, just highlight or just emphasize the importance of understanding the cause of the economic fluctuation. Otherwise, otherwise we are going to see this suffering again. Okay. Very good. So now we can look at this business cycle. Okay, what what do we just take a closer look at regarding to this fluctuation? Okay. So we are going to look at the time period from 1985 to 2014. During this 20 years period, so the U.S. economy experienced three interruptions or three recessions. So in either one of those three cases, you can see there's a decline or there's a disruption. On the left hand side, this is a private sector employment. On the right hand side, this is, uh, um, yeah, I think so. Sorry. So, this is our deeper way to see the same data. Okay. So, this is sort of later on. The left hand side is absolute value or like index. Okay. And clearly, you can see there's a decline. And so, this is 2008 financial crisis, start with the housing market class in the United States. Right. So, that one is considered pretty big. Actually, that one was the worst since Great Depression, and it was called Great Recession. Now, the right hand side, I just look at the same data in a different way to look at percentage change. You can see, so there's a huge collapse or a huge drop in terms of in terms of output and in terms of in terms of uh, um, employment, right? So. Now we are going to give some names regarding to this fluctuation. Okay. We define a recession as a period of the economic downturn when output and employment are falling. Then to go to the previous one, it just refers to recession. It just refers to here, here, and here. 
right? Those three shaded areas. It is a recession. Now, second concept, expansion. And that, that's opposite to recession, meaning the economy is recovering. That means we are gain, we are regain job. We are regain out. Okay. So one is going down, the other is going down. Okay, recession, expansion. Now, what is business cycle? The business cycle is a short-term alternation between these two, like up and down, up and down. Right? So this is called a cycle. And then so in the next slide, we have a stylized graph to show you how the economy usually look like. Okay. The shaded area, let's see if it's in here, the shaded area, you see the economy is going down. So this corresponds to, and excuse me, this, this corresponds to, the rest here. The recession corresponds to here, this is a decline. Right? And that's the what expansion. Expansion is all during the recession because you cannot keep declining. Right? So it, they're always a bottom. Right? Or maybe use this one better, and then we can just go back to this side effect later, right? Or this side effect later. To be precise, so this is a recession, we are going down. And this is expansion, we are recovering. Right? And then the entire thing, this up and down is called a busy cycle. Okay? Now, there are two more critical points. Two more critical points. Critical point number one, let's use a triangle here. And the critical number two, let's use a circle here. Can anyone tell me about the particular, what's particular about the triangle and this circle? Start with this triangle. Start with this triangle. So after the triangle, what happened? After we hit the triangle, what happened? Yeah, recession. So, or in other words, after so, or in other words, so when we hit the triangle, we reach the peak. There's no more room to grow. I want to emphasize in triangle, we're still growing. It's just growing at a slower and slower pace compared to the period before the triangle. Can you see that? Now, similarly, if we look at the circle, what happens? Once we hit the circle and we see, actually, when we approach the circle, we already see the light at the end of the tunnel, right? So we are reaching the worst, and then we start to pick up. But again, similarly, so in the, before we approach, before we approach this circle, the economy is still declining, but it's declining in the more and more gradual pace, right? And then, so we have a specific name for each critical point. Okay. So the triangle, the triangle, like it refers to this dot, the triangle is going to refer to here and here. Right, and we call the P. Okay, so that's the best you can do. Okay, and then the circle in the previous one reverse to here, reverse to here. That's the word. It cannot be worse. You start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so the triangle we call the business cycle. Peaks and the circle we call business cycle troughs. Okay, but remember, so even at the peak, you are immediately you're going to see the decline in the economy. But before the peak, the economy was expanding. In the trough, even though 
right after the trial, you see the economy to grow. But before you reach trial, you still decline. So this is very important, right? All right, so this is business cycle. And this is usually how the economy will behave in the short run, right? To close this part of the discussion, you may wonder, or I'm trying to explain to you, so why we care to our city? This is because the recession is going to bring tremendous pain to our economy, and the largest one, or the most, most vivid one, or most, most important one we care is that it's going to bring job loss, right? So like 2020, so I guess some of you have experienced either either yourself or maybe a friend or your family or you heard about someone, right? And the back in, this is the picture back in 1929, the Great Depression, we sort of data earlier, right? So there's like, the, in the worst days, 30% of people got their job, and this was often for almost 10 years, right? So people lose their job, they are gonna lose their income, and then they are gonna have some trouble to feed their family, right? Then there's such a line up for, like in this background picture show, they have been lined up for free food. Right. Your question? Okay. Right. So the business cycle and particularly the fluctuation in unemployment is a main concern for policymakers. What's policymaker essentially the government? Right, so the prison. Right, so they are trying to help the economy, trying to provide, trying to generate jobs. And then, so the main goal is trying to attempt or trying to mitigate the population. Or, in other words, if they can, if they can, they were hoping so to push this down, push this down, push this down. Right, indeed, actually, indeed, indeed, it helps. Right, so the evidence coming from Come from here, like I showed you earlier. Sorry. Coming from here. Now, as you can see, let's take a look at 2020. After a sharp, sharp, very sharp divide, and they pick up very quickly. Okay? Another way to see that is so, after World War II, most of the recession is much shallower compared to Great Depression. Right? So, those are everything. Okay, this is regarding to business cycle. Oh, sorry. Now we'll look at this five years question. The use of taxes and common spending to change the overall level of spending is called, is called physical part, right? So we have a definition, but certainly we are gonna have one um, individual chapter to fit this card this Second one. Do you think the government is right to begin to begin massive spending program during deep recession? So by the way, so actually, so this background picture here, I believe this is my belief. This is just part of the great deal. So this is just, uh, they were trying to build this uh, Hoover Dam. Right? Do you think? What do you think? Is this a right choice or not? Based on the information we you have gathered so far, huh? Yes, right. So this is actually this is a common belief since Great Depression. But again, not everyone, not everyone agree. Okay, not everyone agree. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a video later, and then there's another school of thought. They hold opposite view. But I must say. Today, majority or most of the macroeconomists and also the most policy makers hold such a belief. They, they think so, our trouble caused by demand. They believe that when we in a trouble, when we in a trouble time, the government should stimulate. So this has been, this has been applied repeatedly in history, okay? All right, so now we look at the, look at the other important topic in macroeconomics. Okay, which is long-run economic growth. 
to appreciate the importance of downward economic growth so we can take a closer look at this picture. There are two dimensions to examine in this picture. Number one is in terms of quantity, how we see the quantity. If we look at 1905, if we look at the percentage of American households as electricity, only the region who has electricity. But look at today, even in 1990, even in 1955, pretty much everyone has the electricity. And now is everyone has electricity. Right? So this one way. This is this so behind the this chain is what is gonna go because we have the capacity to generate electricity or to provide electricity in an affordable way. In an affordable way, it's like that all Americans can pay for electricity, but we cannot take this for granted, right? Look at 1905, and even today, even right now, okay? In the earth, on earth, okay, in, 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 in not worldwide, not everyone has electricity, right? So there are many, but even like in India, and not to mention Africa. In India, not everyone has electricity, right? So we cannot take that for granted. This one. Thing. Now, the other way to look at that, oh, by the way, just tell you the true story, okay? So when I was in uh, middle school, okay, by the way, so I grew up in China, when I was in middle school, this is roughly like a 25 or 30 years ago, when I was a teenager, the electricity is not very stable in my hometown. Uh, during the night, open time, we, we, we lose electricity and then we have to use candles to study. That's how I grew up. Okay, we cannot take that for granted, all right. Uh, all right, so the other way to appreciate this picture is in terms of so quality, how we see the quality. It's very obvious. So it means there are many things, like here, those are things did not exist in 1955. And those are things did not exist in 1905. It's just regardless how rich you are. In 1905, even though you are Henry Ford, okay, you don't have access to digital camera. It's just regardless of how rich you are. All right, but now it's pretty much, at least in the United States, is just pretty much everyone has access to digital camera. Sorry. And, and I need to be precise. So the, the number is like uh, 40, 50%. If we consider the uh, smartphone, it's probably 90%, right? So this is another way to appreciate the economic growth, okay? Now we can look at the data in a slightly different fashion, okay? So this is real GDP. Again, so right after this chapter, we are going to look at GDP and we are going to study what is real GDP. We look at here, you can see the in the past century, so there is a huge improvement measured by real GDP, and this is per capita. In a simple way, this is essentially just measuring how much a typical American can consume, or how much a typical American can earn, or how much a typical American can produce, right? So if you look at one single year, or if you compare one year to the other, it's tiny change. But if you just expand the scale, look for well, one century, you can see the huge change. Right. But I want to emphasize now run economic growth is a recent phenomenon. To be precise, before 1800, if we look at human history, regardless which country you look at, if you look at thousands of years, there wasn't much change in terms of standard living. Okay, so this is like a quick case study. So you just comparing two countries, you can see their standard living is going to, it's going to be dramatically different over time. But then 
a critical question remain or there's a crit critical question we need to ask what explain what explain their difference or what explain their different paths during the past century so here we're just comparing two countries argentina versus canada they start with more or less the same in terms of economic performance but they the end with a dramatic difference we need to keep in mind the one question what explains the difference right okay so now we move to the next one inflation and the deflation right i guess right now is the perfect time for us to understand inflation the recession became more and more for many things right not only gas pretty much everything rent uh grocery tuition internet food everything right so the rising price rising price is called inflation on the other hand if price is falling it's called deflation okay and uh, we don't like neither okay so this we are going to explain so why we don't like neither but what do we like we like price stability meaning so we want the price is relatively relatively stable it doesn't change too much it doesn't change too much right so the other reason we look at we pay close attention to inflation is that in the short run inflation is related to business cycle and it usually usually when the economy is in the recession price tends to fall on the other hand when the economy is in the expansion price tends to rise or usually there's going to be a inflation right but we need to understand why but we are going to leave that for future chapter so keep in mind so there's an interesting correlation between price level and the business cycle or to be precise there's an interesting correlation between price level and unemployment because unemployment is a key indicator for inflation however in the long run in the long run the price the price has nothing to do with this inflation the price level is going to determine by change in money supply again so we will leave that for future to understand what is money supply Okay. Right. So now here I need, need to explain to you so why we care. Why we care about price stability. Okay. Why we don't like uh, inflation or deflation. Inflation. It's going to hurt us because you're going to lose your purchasing power. Right. So again, again. So right now it's, uh, it's uh, probably the best time for us to understand that. And so you're going to pay more for the same thing. You're losing your purchasing power, right? So this also is going to hurt the uh, hurt the government in a very extreme case. Just imagine if you really feel disappointed by the inflation. Okay, in the worst case scenario, you may stop to using, you may stop using the money, right? You probably just hoard your stuff. You don't use the cash anymore. If that's the case, the government is going to lose one way to generate money. Remember, so the government can generate revenue by printing money, right? Okay. So now, on the other hand, deflation, meaning so price keep falling. If price keep falling, what are you going to do? So you're going to hold on your purchase as long as possible. Why? Because each dollar you hold is going to bring you more value. Why you want to spend now? You want to spend later. But that's going to hurt the economy. So it's going to deepen our recession. Remember, usually deflation happens during recession. Inflation usually happens in expansion. So if, this is, if we are in a re recession, price is falling, and then so you may not want to spend because you was expecting the price going to fall further in the future. But that's going to make the, uh, make the recession even worse. Right. And here, so I'm going to show you a piece of history. Okay. On the left hand side, 
this is a receipt. This is a receipt coming from one of my students. It's very special case. So look, so this is 1972, if you can read. January of 1972, these students, so he checked in this hotel in Santa Monica. Okay, and from this receipt, you can see what is the price or what is the rate. It's around $19 per night. Now, if you're interested in, actually, this is what I did, but this is like a few years ago. So what you just, if you like, you can check this hotel. It, it, it just simply changed the name, but the building still there. And the rate is more than 10 times. So this is what we call inflation, All right? Okay, so now the last topic I'm going to review for these slides or well, for today's lecture is about international imbalance or international trade. First, we must realize in modern days, most countries are open economy, means they are going to do business with the rest of the world, means they import or they, at the same time they export. This is what we mean open economy, except some countries under international sanctions, like North Korea, Cuba, or Russia. Now, even Russia still has a lot of inflow and outflow of goods and services. Right. Okay. What is trade deficit? Meaning you import more than you export. But import essentially you just purchase more. Then you can sell to the rest of the world. And then what is trade surplus? That's obviously. So you export more than you can import. Right? So this is a trade surplus and a trade deficit. For the US, most of the time, our economy is in a trade deficit. Now here, we show a few countries. This in a particular year, except in the United States here, we export less than we import, and we have a deficit, right? Meaning so we, in the international market, we spend, more than we can earn. You should you should try and ask your question. So how we are going to finance this shortfall? How we can finance this? Just think about individuals. So if you spend more than you can earn, what are you going to do? You've been the debt. You've got more. You must borrow, right? Here's the same. That just is literally that just means so US is going to borrow from the rest of the world to pay for this trade imbalance. But on the other hand, if you get Germany or China, so they export more than they import, meaning so they are going to have extra savings. And as a matter of fact, so that means that the Germany or China is going to lend to the United States so that the United States can purchase this extra amount of import. All right. Okay, now let's look at this practice question. This year, the value of country's import is equal to 1.2, and the value of export is equal to 1.3. Is the country in a surplus or deficit? It's in a surplus, right? So they export or they sell more than they import or they purchase, right? The difference is 0 0.1 trillion of uh, what uh, billion. All right, so I'm going to skip this. Right, I'm going to skip this as well. So now I prefer two videos to watch. Okay? So I'm going to start with this one. Uh, we don't have time to watch the other one. The other one, let me just give you a give you an overview what this is about. So this one is just uh, show you two, two different thoughts regarding to the cost 
and the consequence of recession. Okay. If you look here, so actually you can see. So in this in this video, there are two famous economists. On the left hand side, this guy is played for this actually is is just uh he's played for uh John Maynard Keynes. On the right hand side, this gentleman was uh is played for uh Haya. Okay, so they have almost opposite view regarding to the cause of the recession. And furthermore, they have almost all the view regarding to what the government should do. But unfortunately, or fortunately, so this day, as I mentioned earlier, majority will listen to Keynes or they follow the Keynes uh, right. Okay, so now let's just go back to this one. This one is about inflation. Okay, and I find out it's quite interesting. For the other ones, I'll encourage you to watch yourself. Uh, I see it's here. Oh, yes, yeah, right here. Things are expensive. The prospect of layoffs is also causing additional stress. Increasing incentives to cut costs wherever we can. The self control can be hard. It creates a conflict between our long term goal of saving and our need to feel good now. That conflict plays out in areas of the brain involving cognitive control and processing rewards. Say you're thinking of getting a fancy latte. The brain's reward circuit, which includes the amygdala and the ventral parietal, motivates you to treat, yell, sell. But then there's the prefrontal cortex, which handles impulse control and helps you plan for the future. Candace Rayo, a cognitive neuroscientist who studies self control, says that the brain integrates signals from these areas to come up with a reward value. That value is determined by how beneficial a certain choice might be. And that's what's driving choice behavior. When you hit that latte, your prefrontal cortex nudges that reward value towards more financially sound decisions. So it helps us choose in favor of our long term goals. This balancing act is relevant to any choice where there's an inherent conflict between short, and long-term outcomes. Researchers used to think that when we gave into temptations, the ability of our prefrontal cortex to exert self-control was just poof, gone. Instead, it's limited, kind of like your money. So if you've been constantly making tiny decisions about how to save on groceries or how to cut down on your electric bill, you may not have enough cognitive resources to keep yourself from splurging. That's what happened to my coworker, Rachel Wolf. She wrote an article about revenge spending after dropping $40 on hand. So not everybody is splurging. It obviously requires a little bit of flexibility in your budget. What drove me was definitely frustration. I've been trading down in so many other places in my life. Rachel and the other consumers she spoke to figured the iffy economy wasn't going to change anytime soon. And when they chose to splurge, it was because self-control simply cost them too much. I think it speaks to the mental gymnastics we're all doing, and um, it's it's the balancing act. There's two things going on here. First, our brains value rewards in the future less than rewards in the present. And second, stress. This includes financial stress, which may magnify our desire to feel good. It also compromises the ability of the prefrontal cortex to control impulsive behavior. Stress-related hormones like norepinephrine and cortisol can impair the ability of the prefrontal cortex to incentivize behavior that aligns with our long-term goals. Stress also makes reward areas more sensitive to dopamine, a molecule that makes us feel good. This is why stress can make rewards seem more rewarding and self-control more difficult. So you kind of have a, a double hit impairing these self-control decisions. That means that stressors like inflation, rising housing costs, and plagues can prime us for indulgent behavior. And this is a problem, right? Because it's when we're under stress that we really need these resources to control our behavior and make choices that align with our long-term goals. So what can you do to make sure you're nice to yourself without breaking the bank? To get answers, I called up Michael Leach, a cognitive psychologist at Wells Fargo. Don't be overly frugal unnecessarily because that can exhaust your mind. Michael also suggested writing a list of small treats that make you happy, but won't set you back financially. He and Candace told me that exerting self-control all the time isn't necessarily good either. And reframing financial discipline as rewarding can also help, especially if you actually get to see the money piling up in the banking, which also leads to a peace of mind emotion that a lot of people say the desire when it comes to their money. He suggested keeping a financial diary and updating it at three, six, and 12 months to track your progress. 
Hopefully seeing those dollars adding up will give you the burst of dopamine you need to motivate you to keep saving and avoid too much revenge spending. Just keep in mind that dopamine isn't just the field of mode. It's also about motivation. All right, so we stop Three, here. Oh, that's right. Two, one, and let's get this All right, we stop here uh, and see you.